out of around 2,000 patients, 800 were brought for uh, evaluation. So I'm very choosy. You have to have the patients right. You have to be, like most good surgeons, we have kind of, you know, a success rate of about 90%. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're already in season four, can you believe it? And we finally managed to track a man down all the way from Ireland. It's a great honor to have Munish Shandilia on the show today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've been watching. So I don't know if you remember how many years back that was that we were thinking of, you know, meeting in Ireland and see where we can kind of, you know, where we can pick up yeah. from each other. And before I knew you were a star. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 10 years ago. It's, the first it's, time it's, it's time. been like that. And the second thing then, uh, and things went very, very well, uh, you became the Sutradhar. Sutradhar in Sanskrit means catches everybody and pu puts them in a garland. Wow. That's yeah? cool. Eh? So there's so many people, so many good teachers, so many kind of, you know, I mean, you're the man who kind of, you know, brings everybody yeah. together in a very nice way and kind of, you know, gets everything out of them. Oh, Manish, thanks. That's so kind of you. So, so tell me, uh, for the listeners, because, I mean, the people might, might not be able to necessarily watch it on YouTube, but, like, how come there's an Indian guy who does rhinoplasty in Ireland? I am so <laughs> interested to know. There's, there's a reason for that. So, um, so let me start how I got interested in rhinoplasty. Yes. I was all, always interested, like, to do kind of, you know, a bit of arty things and all that. Recently, I've started painting, actually started learning from the uh, New York Art Academy. No and I decided that it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, abstract art I'm going to start with. Anyway, so going back to 1996, I did my fellowship, FRCS in yes. Ireland. And uh, there, so after, you know, big exam, you kind of go yeah. for holidays. A friend of mine was in Manhattan uh, uh, and uh, I attended Goldman uh, Seminar. Tip wow. seminar. But that's like 25 years ago. Almost. 96, right? Wow. And I'm watching these people. Bobby Salmon was my kind of you know, guru. Yeah, How yeah. was this guy kind of coming in and out? He was about to retire or maybe kind of five years within it. And I saw uh, Dean Toriumi and I saw kind of, you know, uh, uh, Eugene Tardy and all these people and the enthusiasm they had and the people that they had kind of, you know, looked after over yeah. the years. Scott, that, that's, that's really very good. You make people so happy. Yes. But that's the thing, like, you know, for me, the rhinoplasty is like, you know, to, to be able to make people happy. And the second part of the practice, actually, that I have the way I've developed is that how to make sure that the other thing doesn't happen, that you leave them unhappy. What is the, what is the best you can do? Yeah, yeah. And what are the steps you can do? What are the protocols you can make? And that kind of thing. That's fascinating. We're going to chat about that a little bit later. So... So we dial back to almost 30 years ago, you attend the summit and then from there, how did your practice expand in Ireland? Because there's not many people who are doing purely rhinoplasties, so I understand. Were, yeah, very few people actually were uh, devoted to rhinoplasty. And when I did that, uh, uh, that week, all the money I, I had, I bought Eugene Tardy's book. There was many, many kind of, you know, the OCNAs, you know, the Odlering College Clinics. Yes. Whatever I could buy, I brought them over. Wow. And in Ireland that I started doing rhinoplasties. Yeah. So I used to do some locum work for consultants. And during those periods, I would do a lot of rhinoplasty. Very basic. The aim was always do it less than what you can do. Always. And so always right from the beginning, I could see, you know, take... I mean, you can call it the low-hanging fruit or you yeah. can call it kind of, you know, the easy, safe, safety. Safety is the biggest thing. So kind of never, never try to bite more than you can, you know, handle. And that's my philosophy. The thing is, you know, start slowly and kind of, you know, make people happy. And that's... Uh, so I know off air we were chatting just now about BDD and it's really something I'm, I, I want to try and... Um, like extrapolate a little bit. The whole point of season four is you want to go for the gold, you know? Yeah. And, and there's this issue around unhappy patients. Yes. So give us some pearls of wisdom and what your experience is around that. So let me come a bit backwards. Let me, uh, uh, with the 10 years of work on BDD, yeah. which is very unusual that we have actually, we start, I started a, a protocol of mandatory psychiatric evaluation in cosmetic rhinoplasty. Everybody, okay, 
few kind of, you know, sports people, perhaps not trauma people, perhaps yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, but yeah. majority of them. And what I found was, so why did I start that? Because I saw that kind of, you know, when you make people happy, your life is so good. I've, I've heard you talk about people kind of, you know, how when you have an unhappy patient, like, oh. you know, how it brings you down. Absolutely. So the opposite is true that, you know, when you have a happy patient, you know, when they're coming in, the your day is made. Another one comes in, yours, you know, I mean, it's you go home very, very happy, yeah. right? Uh, so I decided that, okay, what is the main thing here? The main thing is perception. How the person perceives the result more than anything. You do a great job. You diagnose well and you, you explain it to them what needs to be done. Eventually, what, how they perceive the result is going to make them happy or not. So is the perception the same for everybody? Of course it's not. So how do you check that? So body dysmorphia is mainly one of the kind of commoner situations where uh, you kind of, you know, you're not sure if the person is going to perceive it properly or not. And, you know, I mean, can, what can you do about it? It is not their fault if they don't understand because, you know, we are the specialists. So we should be able to kind of see what patient uh, is good candidate. It looks like a very simple thing. Everyone has been doing it for kind of, you know, any mature and very, very good rhinoplasty surgeon has always done it. Mm -hmm. They have this gut feeling, they know how to do it mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. But when you add the psychiatric evaluation, the science to it and keep on doing it, you get kind of, you know, the feedback. Yeah. That I think this patient is good. And then when you do it, your feedback is good and you kind of you know, get consolidated. Now, so the question is, do you yourself do that evaluation or do you send the patient to somebody? So my policy is, again, I'll have to kind of expand on this. That first thing I do is every patient has spent 45 minutes and decide whether I'm going to take this patient or not. Okay. Is that a good person or not? Person, sorry, uh, not person, yeah, yeah, I know patient. You yes, I know a patient. Is, yes. Do they have, do, are they a good candidate for kind of, you know, can I do a good job and make them happy? And are there any red flag signs which, you know, it's, it's been described? Uh, so any patient that I think that I'm going to take on, every such patient goes to the psychiatrist, not before. If I'm not interested, I'm not going to waste their time on psychiatrist time. Okay. And a psychiatrist spends nearly 50 minutes with every patient. So there's a second opinion that is kind of, you know. So, so I'm going to try and get this right in my head. So you're going to decide I'm going to operate this patient, yes or no. Yeah. But which ones do you then decide to send to the psychiatrist? Everyone so, that I'm, I'm really? chosen, every single person that I think I'm going to, you know, this looks like a nose I can uh, fix. I think she'll be happy. He will okay, be so happy. So my question is, why do you do that? Why? You see, where I'm getting to is, yes. in my mind, as much as I love the psychologists, they've never done a rhinoplasty. Sure. And in my mind, that's, that's we the... should be trusting ourselves on it because I've burnt myself. I've sent a patient to the psychologist. No problem. This is a great patient to the operation. And it was a complete disaster. Yeah. So that's, 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 you have to, the psychiatrist is a very, so our paper, which I'm very, very uh, honored that kind of, you know, been asked to be the guest uh, editor for this journal we are coming up with, with the, with only outcomes and BDD and all that. Brilliant. Nearly which 10 journal articles. journal is it going to be? Time and, you know, it's a facial plastic surgery, our, okay. our journal. And uh, so that's going to be, in the next three to four months. It's nearly there. People are contributing to it. So every, and this, in my opinion, in my particular kind of you know, view, BDD is not an issue anymore for me because I understand it so well. You can never be 100% right about yeah. it, but uh, the confusions were, uh, what is the incidence of, you know, we were told 30%, 25%, 40%, it's not that high. So the thing is, I think we've been taught a bit kind of, when you are the surgeon, you are going to be responsible for this patient. The most important thing is, are you happy with the patient? Yes. And that's how you start, in my opinion. But the, the challenge is when you, at the beginning of your career, it, it's like if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. At yeah. the beginning of your career, anyone who comes into your rooms and thinking of a rhinoplasty, you just want to do the rhinoplasty. But th of, that's how you learn your... You, out of 2,000 plus, again, the, uh, the numbers, I, uh, believe me, uh, out out of around 2,000 patients, 800 were brought for uh, psych evaluation. So I'm very choosy. You have to have the patients right. You have to be, like most good surgeons, we have kind of, you know, a success rate of about 90%. So I want to ask you that question. So what is your, what I call the conversion rate? So if a patient comes into your rooms, you're going to actually end up doing the operation with having all this background checks you're doing. So say, for example, 
100 patients are actually going to, through your website or through your rooms, request mm -hmm. to come and see you. Mm -hmm. How many of those 100 will you end up actually operating? I would say 50. Really? Yeah. yeah. And the reason for that is not just that kind of, you know, you have, uh, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes their kind of, you know, ideas are delusional. Sometimes it's not that tough, but it's some, something like, you know, there are so many reasons. There are red flags all over the place. And the point is, rather than operating on somebody and leaving them unhappy, uh, you can see, I mean, sometimes if I find that, you know, this person would benefit from surgery, what is the best I can do to, to, to do that? I'll sometimes bring them again, second time, another day. Let's see how sh they and me behave on the day. So I've spent time on that kind of, you know, it's, it's a... I think Randall is such a beautiful surgery, as we all know, yeah. but the beauty lies when you get it right. Yes. You know, that's why 90% of we talk about is do this technique, that suture, that. To me, everything is psychology. It's like, you know, if you, th you know before so operating whether I will have a good outcome here or not, because you know that what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm not going to be complicated, yeah. you know, many, many graphs and many things. And uh, what I do in my hands, uh, nine out of 10 are, kind of, you know, satisfied. So that's a, it's a happy kind of, you still get kind of occasional patients where you kind of, you know, you're surprised, but that's, that's how yeah. it is. Yes, I, it's fascinating to hear you talk about this stuff. It's something that's not spoken enough about. So, uh, well, I've done about 110 <laughs> international lectures on this by now in yeah. the last 10 years. We've been doing this. Uh, so over, what we have done now, you know, so the psychiatrist is also involved in the papers we have written. And it's a very kind of, you've gone over it again and again. And uh, the first article that we have written about is uh, a man man uh, mandatory psych evaluation. Second one is we have operated on 15 mild BDD cases with good results with an uh, average uh, uh, follow-up of about 50 months. Mm -hmm. 50 months, am I right? Kind of five, six years. So that's a very substantial kind of you know, outcome. Third one is then the audit of all the works we have done in rhinoplasty. So how many... Uh, so, when, you know, when, when I did that audit, 25% uh, uh, of the patients said, my outcome is 10 out of 10. And I said, yeah, <laughs> you know, of course I didn't believe in them. But it, what it says is that they are happy patients. 90% of the patients scored their uh, VAS from 7, 8, 9 or 10, which is good. Great. great. You know, but there is 10% which will also have your revision cases. They will also have the unhappy patients. The The... One tries not to make enemies. You know, if a person is unhappy, you can't make them any more happier. If they feel that you did what you could do, you know, that's good enough, I think. Sure. And you keep improving if you can. Okay. Last question I want to try and get my head around is, uh, I should be calling you Mr. if I understand correctly. Not doctor. Eh? That's how it works in, the, in Ireland. Or do you... Are you, a, are you a mister or a doctor? Oh, uh, mister, yes. Mister, okay. Mister, Kister Mundaktor. That's great. Eh? This is what I want to ask you. We've spoken about the patient's happiness. You're quite a jolly fellow, but how do you look after your own happiness? Okay. So, uh, very interesting, excuse me. Um, uh, some, uh, one of the, when I'm in the, in the zone, There'll be months and months when I'll come home and I'll uh, record music and mix music, that kind of thing. So sometimes kind of, you know, when we get it, it's, it's, it possibly is kind of, you know, not copyright or something like, you know, there is Double Trouble by Eric Clapton. Yeah. So I have actually mixed an Indian uh, song uh, uh, by Kishore Kumar, who is like the yeah. very, very famous singer. Yeah. And it's an interesting mix. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I do. Yeah, uh, yeah just kind of, you know, music. I recently bought a saxophone, but I'm, I'm afraid to start learning no, it. But I will do, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, nice. And this painting, the new, new, the new interest. <laughs> it's great. Huh? So, yeah. I'm, I'm generally kind of, uh, maybe I avoid uh, things that are not kind of particularly cool. Try and avoid them. You know. Maybe a kind of, you know, way of, uh, you know, we all have our defense mechanisms and kind of, you know, uh, humor and whatnot. So I try not to dwell on No, that's great. But I mean, Manish, from my side, it's just lovely to have this little, kind of your little opening of your soul to us and the people on the podcast, just to listen to 
to you and your insights. It's, it's fascinating. Eh? So thank you for your time. Thank you well, for, for... Lovely to meet you. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about this and I said, God, I mean, you know, and then COVID came and you called me the second time. I said, what, what are you doing? What are you up to? And before I, before I could give you an answer, the, you know, another bit of your uh, webinar and whatnot. <laughs> yes. So I think we have to keep closing things and, you know, making things tight for you okay. to give you another spot. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Eh? Very kind of Guys, you. Guys, come back next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests. Music